because the coronation has to be perfect. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the finale video for the MLP Stream of Nations. Obviously, we're just still live. We've just been talking, but this is the part that's going in the VOD. Um, obviously, the first part about this, I just want to talk briefly uh, in a very vague and generalized sense of the word about how awesome it's been covering this show. I actually already talked about this last week, but it deserves repeating. I have never covered a show more interesting to cover than this one from a narrative perspective. Uh, I learned a lot more about the behind the scenes and the construction and craft and production of television over in the Star Trek stuff. I learned an enormous amount of stuff over there, and I actually have been using it when it comes to my own show and will use it going forwards. But MLP, from a purely narrative perspective, has been an absolutely joy and treat to dig into. There's so much to cover and so much to analyze and so much to discuss about economics and social politics and militaries and the role of the military and personal doubt and love and loss and suicide and all sorts of things all in between. It has been fascinating to discuss this show. That's the first thing I wanted to say because my niece, many years ago at this point, was like, hey, I want to watch this show. And I was like, well, let me go watch it for you. And me and her father... Uh, you know, divvied up the roles and we watched them and it was like, okay, no, this looks like a well-constructed, you know, good show for our kiddo to watch. So I started watching it with her and here we are. <laughs> so interesting path there. Thanks, kiddo. I appreciate you as I always do. Now, uh, the first thing I want to talk about, a bit of a wrap-up thing, is I want to talk about these things are counters. This is actually interesting. One of the reasons I like to do counters, one of the reasons I like to do hard data is because preconceptions never really line up with reality. I've noticed this a lot, and it's one of the reasons I try to keep track of these kind of things. It's also one of the reasons why I try to review in the manner that I review. For example, if I mention Mass Effect 3 to most people, they will say, oh, Mass Effect 3 sucks because all they're thinking about is the ending. But if you actually sit down and analyze it, I imagine that, the, that it's going to not go that same way because we're magnifying certain things in our memory and diminishing the others. This is a good example of this. So we only had 24 rarity crushes in the entire show. Nowhere near as many as I thought. It was just something that kept bothering me and bothering me. And yet it's only 24 of them. 70 watt was, that's actually quite a few. Uh, but at the same time, percentage wise, I think that's still less than we had over on Star Trek. Ponyville damaged? Six. Again, this is something I was expecting way, way more of, because in my mind, in my memory, it's a common thing, but as we see, it really isn't. Same thing with the books being knocked off the shelves. We actually added that one, if you remember. Continuity counter is through the freaking roof, and let's be honest, that number is lowballing it, because there's several times where we were just like, uh, whatever. <laughs> Can't a lot damage. One. Counter continuity counter, that did we did have several of those character assassination moments in like usually in the blue episodes, but a lot less than you would think. And then we have the arc counter, which is basically just a magnified continuity counter, and yeah, quite a few arc episodes as we were going through the work. All of this says a lot about the kind of nature and construction of the show this is. Some people really early on mentioned how anti-continuity this show is. I don't think I can say that fairly anymore because I was kind of with them then, and I am no longer. <clears throat> but, you know me, I like to throw together hard data to really discuss and analyze a few things, because I am a geek. And also because I like to look at reality as close to true as is possible. So, let's just go with this one first. Yep, okay. So, this is the easiest uh, and simplest one to explain. This one right here is the percentage of quality in this show. As you can see right here, uh, purples being the best, red, then reds, then oranges, then yellows, then greens, then blues. And yes, there is a sliver of black for the one lamentation this show got. Now, unfortunately, I do not have this data for the previous shows. Uh, kind of. So what I mean by that is I was keeping track of the quality of both TOS and ENT, but all of that data is still in raw format and I haven't done anything with it, so I don't have it prepared for you today whatsoever. Point remaining, that ratio is insanity. If you're paying attention, uh, that means well over half of the episodes in this show are what I would consider to be above average quality. And a huge portion of them, a third of the episodes of this show are of red quality. And in hindsight and with perspective, I absolutely stand by that. This is an incredible ratio. This might be the highest overall percentage of, of quality I've seen in a show that I've covered. And again, I'm not 100% sure because I didn't keep track at all. 
when it came to Voyager, TNG, Babylon 5, or DS9, and I haven't finished collating the data for TOS or ENT yet, but this is still extraordinarily impressive in its own right here. Let me... Oh, that's the wrong image. So, that being said, we also have a couple of other things here. So, let me get rid of that. Anybody who's been paying attention to the MLP sheet knows most of this stuff already, because it's actually all there. Uh, a lot of the hard, raw data is there. But I just thought I'd share a couple of little tidbits here. So, Season 1 uh, had 11 yellows and 7 oranges and 5 greens. No purples whatsoever. It is, in fact, the only season that had no purples. And that sounds about right. As is usual for virtually every show ever made, ever, Season 1 is the weakest season, and that's totally true here. It's also the a good quarter of all the yellows in the entire show are all in Season 1, so that tracks. Then we move on to Season 2. Uh, oh yeah, by the way, Season 1 had a blue. Season 2 is interesting because Season 2 is the only season with no blues. Make of that what you will, but it's also worth noting that Season 2 also has one of the highest numbers of reds. An astonishing 12 reds out of a 26-episode run, and 4 purples. In fact, there's only one other season that surpasses that on sheer quality of reds, which we'll get to in a minute. Then we get to Season 3. Season 3, of course, was the, the truncated one. That's the shorter one. That one is just spread all over the place. So there's not much to say about it. Season 3 is, is the rainbow season. It's, it's just all over. Then we go up to Season 4, and it's like, okay, well, now we've got the show going, and what do we do now? 4 is interesting, because 4 has a pretty high ratio of greens and reds. It's much more hit and miss when it comes to Season 4. Very few uh, yellows. Uh, very few extremes, but a whole lot of quality on both ends of the scale, which leads us to Season 5, which has tied for the most purples in any season. Season 5 also has a ton of reds, but also more blues than the previous season so far. Nevertheless, the fact that Season 5 peaks this high says a lot. Season 6 is the other king of red season. Huge number, 12 number of reds in the entire season, and a, and a blue. Or, sorry, and a purple, sorry. Um, a lot of averages, though, so that's kind of another peaks and troughs kind of a situation, which leads us to Season 7. Season 7 is, ironically, another rainbow season. It's almost even across the board. 6, 5, 4, 4, 6. Season 8 leans higher in quality. They started finding themselves more, much fewer greens and yellows, much more oranges and reds, which leads us, of course, to Season 9, which almost has as many purples as the previous two kings and has a ton of reds and our only lamentation, not counting the other one. But all of that's just me talking, so you know what, I thought about, why don't I do something like this? So, hang on. Okay. This is something I've actually been wanting to do with Trek for a while, and in fact, I plan to do this for both TOS and ENT, so consider this a little bit of a uh, prototyping. This is the quality of every episode in order. This took a minute to throw together, let me tell you what. You can kind of see the patterns. It, it certainly, and maybe it doesn't look like there's a lot of patterns here, but you can kind of see the trending. In fact, I actually added the trending bar, which is that red bar in the middle there, to show the overall trend of average quality, which, as you can see, starts at about a 5, which is above average, and ends at about a 6, which is uh, red. And that says all it needs to as well. But you can also kind of see exactly, yeah, you can see where going to see it is, because it's the only one that goes down below, too. But yeah, lots of mountains, lots of crevasses. This actually surprised me more than I thought it would, because, I mean, we could look at them seasonally, but ultimately, while the show does trend upwards, and it does, that's what the trending bar is there for, you can tell that the quality is just absolutely all over place once you get to season two. And I mention that because you can tell where season one is, can't you? It's the thing just kind of hovering at the beginning there. Uh, where it's everything's hovering around below average to, you know, less than below average. And it's just kind of, ugh, over there. And then we start to see purples and reds and purples and reds and oranges and blues and purples. And it just bounces all over the place. I mention this because there are, yeah, there's a lot more peaks than there are valleys. And there's a lot that could be inferred from this, but I'm just going to go ahead and move on. I just wanted to share the actual visual of this. But I do actually have some other information for you as well. Is that one? That's, okay, so... I'm going to show this. Uh, that's the wrong screen, but that's okay, because I can fix that very quickly by going over to here. So, this is data I actually collated a while ago for the Trek Rewrite, believe it or not. So what you're seeing right here 
is something that I'm failing to move. There we go. This is the percentage of episodes in Star Trek The Next Generation that are focused on one particular character or another. So you can see the Picard focus there, which is, of course, the huge focus. Look at that. Uh, then no real focus, which also usually means, you know, it's spread out across the whole cast. And then Riker and guest star and Data, which all of that makes sense, but it says a lot about the nature of this show. Because if you pay attention to this chart, well over half of the episodes are focused on, th or sorry, just a under half of the episodes are focused on three characters. The big three. Yeah, exactly, exactly. The big three concept was still absolutely being used in TNG between Picard, Data, and Riker. Now, it's still better spread out than TOS. If I did a chart like this for TOS, you would laugh at it. But here's DS9. Now, this is obviously ob much more spread out. You can tell that even at a glance. The only dominant thing at all is the ensemble episodes, the No Real Focus episodes, which are a whopping third of the entire episodes of the show. Of this, the only person who has a dominant number of episodes focused on them at all is Odo. And even that is only barely above, you know, the next few under him. So much more spread out, much more ensemble cast. And just for fun, here's Voyager, which I also put together. Um, it's funny you say that, we odds. So you'll see that, once again, the ensemble cast is the dominant one. The no real focus episodes are dominant. The second most episodes are focused on Seven of Nine, who didn't even join the show until Season 3. Which says a lot. <laughs> the second focus is actually a tie between the Doctor and guest stars. I've said this before, I've said this again. Uh, uh, Star Trek has always been really focused on guest stars. But you see that, th despite how weird this one is, you'll notice that, once again, Voyager continued the DS9 trend of not actually having the big three. Now, there's some underrepresentation here. It says a lot that Harry only barely has more shows than Kess. Reminder, Kess left the show in Season 3. But you can see how it is still more spread out, and we do get you know it's something closer to the DS9 thing than we got in the TNG thing. So I threw together something, and I apologize for the crudeness of it, but I did literally throw it together this morning. Uh, this is a visual representation of everything I just mentioned, but from MLP. So each one of these circles represents... You can see the size disparity. Each one of them represents how many episodes they have focused towards them. So as you can see, the biggest focus, by a wide margin, is Twilight Sparkle. No surprise there, she is clearly the main character. The second biggest focus, just barely below her, is of course everyone. You know, the, the, the main six. You know, the, the, the no-focus episodes that I mentioned earlier. And then we can see how it spreads out from there, although what's interesting is if you look at this for more than a minute, you might notice that the uh, next biggest chunk of episodes focused on anyone is Starlight Glimmer, so I can see why people don't like her. Yeah, Starlight is the seven of this show. Spike had a surprisingly large number of them, though. I'm actually, I'm actually a little surprised by that. Discord had quite a few, too. In fact, if you're paying attention, Discord actually has more episodes focused on him than Rarity, or Fluttershy. Now that doesn't surprise me that much because you know Discord is extraordinarily popular, but it it is interesting to think about. And we can see how the main six actually line up relative to each other. Twilight is of course absolutely dominant. The next two are Pinkie Pie and Rainbow of all characters. And then of course we, down, uh, we go down a little bit to Rarity and then Applejack and finally Fluttershy who has the least amount of... Yes, that's Discord in the lower left next to Fluttershy. And then Spike in the upper left. Starlight in the upper right. And we'll talk about the Kid Mark Crusaders in just a moment. Um, but yes, you've already noticed the lines. So each of those lines is also sized appropriately. So you notice how there's very few episodes between Fl that are combo episodes, pair episodes, like we was just talking about, between Fluttershy and Twilight, Twilight and Rainbow, uh, Rarity and Twilight, and I think that's all the really small ones. Yep. But then... They also, and it goes up and up and up and up and up, but what really fascinated me about this is the two most common connections between characters were Rarity and Applejack and Pinkie Pie and Rainbow. The two of those had the most pair-up episodes of all of the combos, which is actually fascinating to look at and think about, but actually makes perfect sense. We've talked about many times how Applejack and Rarity became friends in Season 1, 
and stayed friends and worked really well off of each other. And same thing with Pinkie Pie and Rainbow, who were not friends until that first prank episode. And then we're friends ever since. So yeah, there's there's some good dynamics there, and it makes perfect sense that those two particular dynamics will be focused on. What's also interesting, though, is if you look at this, there are no Twilight and Applejack episodes, and there are no Pinkie Pie and Fluttershy episodes. Those are the only two that are not represented in this pattern. Everything else is somewhere, mathematically. But those two, nope. The only things they have are part of the ensemble episodes, which is part of the middle bundle. Now... You may notice this little dot in the lower right. That's the Young Six. It's not that surprising. They don't get that many episodes focused on them. But at the same time, I'm actually surprised at how few episodes are focused on them. I don't understand your question, Leouts, if you don't mind elaborating. Um, but then we look up at the Cutimer Crusaders. Now, it's probably really hard to tell because there's this speck of both uh, Sweetie Belle and Scootaloo because they have extraordinarily few episodes focused on them. You'll notice Apple Bloom is almost twice as large. I think, in fact, I think it's actually two and a half times as large because there are a lot more Apple Bloom episodes than anyone else. But if you look at the Cutie Mark Crusader episodes, there are quite a few of them. In fact, there are more Cutie Mark Crusader episodes than there are Applejack episodes and Fluttershy and Rarity. It's one of the highest uh, quantities. And yeah, the Cutie Mark Crusaders just kind of stumble into existence, and well, there they are. Huge focus, and it worked out extraordinarily well. And I thought this would be a good way to visually showcase, you know, what I was showing off earlier with the pie charts. It took a minute to make, and I, it is a little bit hasty and a little bit thrown together, and I do apologize, but you know what, whatever. I'll be sharing this image in uh, Discord, by the way, for anybody who cares. Oh, gotcha, Weads. Uh, no. Right now, I'm focusing entirely on streaming, and that means that the lore weeks are being discontinued specifically to stream more. Nevertheless, in the future, once I'm more caught up, absolutely, I would love to really dig into topics like this more. But that's a for-the-future thing, not a for-the-immediacy thing, if that makes sense. Anyways. And, uh... I have a few other factoids I could share. You know, I could talk about spreads or colors and stuff like that. But this this chart right here was the one I was most looking forward to showing off and the one I had built in my head for a while. Um, and that's... What's this? Oh yeah, that's that's the quality thing I already showed off. This is still impressive. But yeah, right. Thank you, Ross. There, I knew there was one other thing. Something you probably are aware of is I've been keeping track of every song in the show uh, and how I think of them versus the others. Now I'm not going to tell you. So I have three categories. The okays, the goods, and the greats. Uh, you could think of it as purple, red, and orange, if you prefer. I'm not going to tell you the oranges, because there's like 50 songs here. I will tell you the bottom song, the song at the very bottom of the list, was Fit Right In. I don't remember what that song is, so give me just a second. What was that song? Uh, apparently... Oh, right, Rarity and Yona. Yep, nope, that tracks. That was, that is my least favorite song. Yeah, that absolutely tracks. Uh, above that would be Can't Be a Dragon Here and Blanks, Blank, Blank, Blanks Forever. Now let's scroll up a little bit. The best orange song for me was The Ballad of the Crystal Empire. Color me shocked. But let's talk about the red songs. So in the red, we'll go from bottom to top. How's that sound? So we've got A Glass of Water which is John Delancey's song as Discord. Just give me a glass of water. Um, let's see, hang on. I was wondering where that one was. A Better Way to Be Bad. I couldn't remember that one by name. That's the actual song that's sung uh, in Season 9 between the three villains. Uh, ah, we will be so horrible and evil. Yeah, that whole song. That's a fun one. Just remembering some of these as I go. Let the Rainbow Remind You, which was supposed to be the end of the show song from season three, if memory uh, serves correctly. I'd play these songs, but you know, I don't feel like being copy wronged into oblivion. Out on My Own, which surprised me. It's actually an Apple Bloom solo piece. It's the one where she thinks she's lost her friends and has no idea where to go with. Oh, end of season four, my bad. Wherever the end of show was supposed to be, I, I forget. Uh, the next one, this might also surprise people, The Pony Every Pony Should Know, a rarity song. 
it's very well constructed. It's very good music, but also I really love the lyrics, which, you know, at this point, to be really good, there has to be some extra focus on some of these uh, things other than just being a good song. And that, that starts to get into that one, which leads me, of course, to May the Best Pet Win, which surprised me by its overall quality, but once again was good lyrics and well constructed and a good, nice back and forth kind of a musical song between Fluttershy and Rainbow. Speaking of which, that leads us to Bats. I don't think I need to explain that one, because Bats uh, will make our mark. The second version is above that. Hang on, I gotta actually find that one. Is that... Yep, that's Cutie Mark Crusaders. That's in the... Uh, the Last Crusade. Crusaders of the Lost Mark, excuse me. We'll make our mark. The, the one at the end of the episode, not the one at the beginning of the episode, to be very specific about that. And then we have The Pony I Want to Be, which is also from that same episode. This is the one that's sung by uh, Diamond Tiara. Then we get into the purple songs. At the very top, we have The Magic of Friendship Grows, which I actually don't remember which one it was. Wait, that's the one I literally just listened to, isn't it? Yep, that's the one we just listened to. That was the finale song. The actual finale song. Duh. Um, next one is probably not going to surprise absolutely anyone. Luna's Future. Now, it's extraordinarily short, but it's extraordinarily well sung and well constructed. And it happens to be the type of song that I love. It's it's effectively just one section, one movement. But it's it's too short. But it's so good. It is so good. I have listened to it many times because it's awesome. Um, and yeah, it's, it is effectively right out of rock opera. You're absolutely right. Above that is This Day Aria. This, this is the one sung specifically by Chrysalis. To go ahead and just give that away. The one that, you know, the, the, the kind of dueling song between uh, Chrysalis and uh, Cadenza. Cadence. Above that, In Our Town. Now, this is a weird one because I don't have that much enjoyment for In Our Town as a song to listen to. But it is one of the most perfectly constructed songs in the entire show. Yeah, the propaganda piece. In Our Town, In Our Town. I can't remember any of the lyrics except for the one piece, which, of course, I've quoted many, many times. You cannot have a nightmare if you never dream. I've actually used that quote in many results because of how beautiful, horrible it is. So, Our Town is way up there because of all of that. It's not that great of a music. It's not that great to listen to, but god dang. Which leaves us with the top three. In the number three slot... We're Not Flawless. If you remember, this song wasn't codified back in the day because, by definition, I have to listen to a song multiple times to really decide where it sits. But I did listen to this song multiple times to decide where it sits, and it is, in addition to being a good, fun, enjoyable song, it also has very powerful and very awesome lyrics. In the number two slot, this will surprise absolutely no one, Smile. A relatively early on song, but a perfect song encapsulating everything that Pinkie Pie is, and frankly, the very concept of what harmony actually kind of works in general. Smile is still a extraordinary work, very well done, very well built up, very well sung, just it's it's good, it's good, it's good. So what could possibly be at the number one slot? What could surpass Smile? I've actually already hinted at this because I've already listed several other Cutie Mark uh, the Crusaders of the Lost Mark songs, but the number one song is The Light of Your Cutie Mark, the song with the Crusaders singing to Diamond Tiara. That song I actually have on my, uh, my, my phone. It's one of the only ones I do. And uh, I don't need... Like, what can I even say about that? It is essentially the perfect song. It's powerful, impacting. It's got uh, a good beat, a good tempo, a good presence. It knows exactly what it wants to do, just purely musically, and is enjoyable just to listen to. It's kind of got that whole rock opera thing going for it again. And it also has, it's also very significant, lyrically speaking, you know? Um, 
You can redeem yourself, but, but by helping others, not by being mean. We know you want friends who admire you. You want to be the star without the power to, but there's a better way. There's so much more still left to learn about yourself. See the light that shines in you. We know you can be some pony else. Right? There's just so much power to the lyrics and the significance and the presence and the tone of the tempo. It's essentially a perfect song. That's why it's at the number one slot, which... Of course, brings me to the other thing I wanted to do. This will be the very last thing I do, and then I'm going to chop off because I need to get some freaking groceries. My day is actually quite packed. And that would be rating the best of the best. Now, unfortunately, this is going to be done live because I didn't have time to prep for this. We have several purple episodes, right? So I'm going to do a little bit of a thing here. And I and feel free to join me on this, okay? So I'm just going to write down some episodes. Return of Harmony. Luna Eclipsed. Magical Mystery Cure. Feels better than I thought it would be. Beauty Map. Slice of Life. Amending Fences. They're all M.A. Larson, by the way. Crusaders of the Lost Mark, which we just finished discussing. Hurricane Fluttershy. There are way too many purples in this show. For Whom. The Sweetie Bell Tolls. Twilight's Kingdom. Scroll forward a little bit. Bloom and Gloom. To wear and back again. Uncommon Bond. That's a damn good one. Shadow Play. Bolts Down. The Last Problem. Mod Pie. We know which one that one is. Uh, a Royal Problem. The Perfect Pair. Beginning of the End. What word? Dashing Done. Wasn't expecting that one. Uh, what Lies Beneath. That's when they discover the tree with the young six. There's a one again. Uh, Once Upon a Zeppelin. Another one that surprised me with how good it was. Uh, the ending of the end. I think that might be it. Nope. One more. A horse shoe in. Which I don't remember that one. Which one's that one? It's the only one I don't remember of this whole list. A horse shoe in. A horse shoe in. Hang on. Oh, right. That's the that's the one where Starlight was was going to become the new uh, mayor. Right, right. Starlight and Trixie. Okay, so there's our list. That's a hell of a list. Of this, just vaguely, I know you're not looking at the list like I am, but if you're going to think about like picking like a top three and a bottom three, if you want to narrow it down, or just a top and a bottom, where do you think it would go with that? In fact, here, actually, you know what, you know what I could do? You know what I could do? Hang on. So go ahead and for those of you who want to, whoops, let's uh, let's do it here. Look at the type MLP and then look at the thing. Look at the spreadsheet for a second. Here, I'll mark them all like this. Here's our purples. I just listed them all right there. Okay, I'm sorry. Look, hang on. There. <laughs> if you look uh, in, it's in column M. M as in uh, maple. And I just kind of jotted down all of the purples right there. I, I cut all of them in pink, so it'd be nice and obvious. Where do you think those line up with each other? Now, for me, once again, I can kind of just mentally gradient these out into three categories. Because that's how it works, right? You know, all of this is relatively the same, but once you get to the top of whatever, it really starts to narrow down a little bit. Yeah, I know, I didn't even... I'm doing this by memory right now, live, Traven. <laughs> Uh, we're gonna put this one up there. Yep, absolutely. And we're gonna put this one up there. Hmm, and that one. Sorry, I'm kind of, I'm just kind of doing broad categories right now. This is how I do this, if you're wondering. We'll go ahead and put that one up there because that's absolutely up there. the ending of the end there so there's my top of the of the thing i'm just gonna do three here then we've got like the middle category which will be that one this one this one this one this one it's all gradient you know even if i give something a five out of ten there's gradients in between you know, 4.9999 and 5.9999 
actually let's do this one down here. You know, right, Ross? It's crazy to think about, really. Yeah, that's what I thought. So I was looking something up real quick. A lot of these are sitting in the... Okay, so here's my broad category. I got the top, the middle, the bottom. Uh, so the bottom of the, of the grate for me would probably be... Molt Down, Dashing Done and bloom and gloom i think which was a combination uh episode early on but and then there's a whole lot in the middle which i'm not going to cover but then the top one two three four five six seven eight nine i uh, i made the top category out of nine actually picking from this nine is going to be a pain so give me just a moment here please i think we're going to do it like this Yeah, no, that, that tracks. I'm always a little surprised by my opinion, as weird as that may sound. There. Okay. I think I'm going to stand by this. So let's see what people say in chat, just to list some of these out loud. Rascor mentions his top three are Return of Harmony, Royal Problem, and Raiders of the Lost Mark. Crusaders of the Lost Mark, but... Um, Dream Whisper says, Crusaders of the Lost Mark, none of the rest matter. Act is Amending Fences, The Ending of the End, and The Last Problem. Let's see here. Trathan is The Last Problem at the very top. Lord Haramont says Crusaders of the Mar Last Mark, To Wear and Back Again, and uh, I think that was uh, Twilight's Kingdom? Yeah, Twilight's Kingdom was the one you're thinking of, Lord Haramont. Sean says Hurricane Fluttershy, Luna Eclipsed, and The Last Problem. Very emotional episodes, no surprise there. Ross says, Amending Fences, which he said for forever. The Last Problem. I'm sensing a trend here. And uh, Once Upon a Zeppelin. I'm just going to stop at three. Yeah, Once Upon a Zeppelin really surprised me. Uh, <laughs> Imperial Star Destroyer says, Magical Mystery Cure. To Wear and Back Again. And then Crusaders of the Lost Ark. Weoud says, uh, The Last Problem. Kind of, but not really. And I suppose I'll go ahead and share mine just for the hell of it. So in the number nine slot, I put Hurricane Fluttershy. An excellent, emotional, powerful, very well-constructed episode, which is only not higher on this list because it is an isolated episode that can only sit on its own legs. Above that, I put To Wear and Back Again, which I thought would be higher than it was, but ultimately there's just so much good, right? Nevertheless, To Wear and Back Again is a phenomenal, fantastic character piece focused entirely on side characters, which is awesome. Speaking of which, the episode above that is Slice of Life, which I don't need to explain. Slice of Life was the perfect Slice of Life episode and did everything it needed to with a ton of characterization and a ton of world building. A Royal Problem, I put above that. That would be the episode where Starlight was trying to fix things with the two princesses and freaked out because everything went wrong. Above that, I put The Last Problem. Oh, don't mistake me. The Last Problem is a very good episode, but I can't put it higher because as much as it's well-constructed and well-built, it just doesn't have some things that other episodes do. It is an extremely powerful emotional episode, which, speaking of which, my number four slot is Beginning of the End. The one that laid down so many bricks for what would become Season 9 and lead to the end of things. So my number three slot... I waffled on this one for a bit, but I decided to end up going with Amending Fences, because Amending Fences manages what is effectively both sides of the equation. A very well-constructed episode, that is also extremely emotionally impacting. Bringing us up to the number two slot, The Ending of the End, one of the greatest, if not the greatest, series finales I have ever seen in my life, which does everything right, essentially. Not everything, but almost, almost everything right, and only stumbles twice. Managing to tie in everything and have a satisfying villain and be well-constructed and be emotional and tie up things and it skip over most of the usual narrative drops and just over and over and over quality on top of quality on top of quality. So what could possibly surpass that? Well, if you're paying attention, you already know it's Crusaders of the Lost Mark. Now, 
I don't need to explain why Crusaders of the Lost Mark is on the top of that list, but all I will say is that Crusaders of the Lost Mark is the ending of the end for the Kudamar Crusaders, if you pay attention. It is a culmination of their arc. All of the characters that have been a part of their story since Season 1 all go through and fulfill and end in a fantastic, well-constructed, well-sung, beautifully designed, excellent episode that has emotional beats and is as awesome as it needs to be. And that's my list right there. I, I might change my mind on that tomorrow if you ask me again, because I just did it right now live. <laughs> but I think the point, and this is actually why I was doing this, my point is that there is so much fantastically good stuff in this show that it takes effort to really divine the specific narrow gaps in quality between truly fantastic and also truly fantastic. And that's MLP in a nutshell, isn't it? I hope you all have enjoyed this, what is this, two and a half year journey with me? This has been... <sighs> this has been a trip. This has been a hell of a trip. And yeah, it's not even on the list, Roz. And nevertheless, I do very much thank you all of you for joining with me and enduring the hardships and slings and insults. Idiots. <laughs> and discussing this. Now... I am going to go ahead and chop off the local recording. <laughs>